Have you ever wondered why NPCs in platformer games always stand still and why walking enemies move in cycles? It seems like they're always confined to a specific platform and you can't get them off it. Why is it always like this? And most importantly, why does it seem acceptable to you? On the other hand, did you know that in Moons of Darcelon, both friendly and enemy NPCs are not confined to platforms and can move freely across the entire map? Have you ever wondered how they do it? Or instead, have you ever insulted a Darsenal when it didn't solve a path as you expected? When this happened, did you compare it to NPCs in other indie platformer games you've played? Welcome to Chapter 10 of How Moons of Darcelon Was Made. In this and the following episodes, we'll talk about how Moons of Darcelon solves one of the most difficult and underrated problems in platformer games. Most players, and even a good number of developers, aren't aware of how complex it is to solve the problem of Walker NPC companions in platformer games. So let's begin with the first in an indefinite series of episodes on Walker AI. How do indie platform games typically implement artificial intelligence? Before we begin, I'd like to clarify that this is not a criticism of Hollow Knight. I'm going to use images from Hollow Knight because it perfectly illustrates everything I want to convey. What I say here that might be interpreted as negative toward Hollow Knight or, in reality, toward 99% of 2D platform games are not opinions. They are facts. This is how these types of games work. If you still feel offended because you think I'm saying negative things about your favorite game, please feel free to join the AI haters and leave your derogatory comments down below. And thank you for helping boost the YouTube algorithm. All right, now let's get started. How do indie platform games typically implement artificial intelligence? Well, the most common approach is not to make one at all. In the case of friendly NPCs, they stay still. They are usually static sprites located at a specific point on the map. And rather than characters, they are information points that give you a speech as a guide, suggesting things to do or telling you about their life to add atmosphere to the game. But they move less than Kermit's eyes. In the case of enemies, they are given some movement, but it is usually cyclical. They walk to the right on perfectly flat terrain until they encounter an obstacle, then they turn around. Alternatively, they can chase and attack you if you enter their range, but they can't leave the platform where they move cyclically. They were designed that way, with no possibility of leaving it. And if we push it a bit further, in the case of Hollow Knight, they can also navigate around platforms, which is honestly an improvement compared to most games. But in no case are they capable of platforming by jumping from platform to platform. But the bosses have much more complex movements. Bosses? In many games, bosses don't even have a clear perception of where you are. Sure, they can tell if you're on the left or the right, but their attacks are effective not because they're precise, but because they cover a wide area. It's almost like fighting a blind person with a huge sword. It's your imagination that makes you think the enemy knows what it's doing. But in reality, it's just a machine repeating attack patterns. Many bosses fire random projectiles, hoping one of them will hit you by chance, or because there are so many on screen that it's difficult to avoid them. And what's completely undeniable is that these bosses can't read the terrain. That's why you always fight them in a clear, obstacle-free area they can't leave. Because if they did, they wouldn't be able to move properly. Battles are designed like this. Placing them in a large room specifically tailored to allow the boss to perform its set of moves without bumping into anything. This room is, of course, flat. In any case, they couldn't function outside of their obstacle-free zone. Again, I'm not criticizing the behaviors, let's call them classic, of platformers. I'm simply explaining how they work, just stating facts, so that you can compare them with how the artificial intelligence in Moons of Darcelon functions. And, if you think I'm making these tutorials because I feel the need to tell the world that Moons of Darcelon is superior, the answer is... Yes! Of course! I've searched for other games with better than average AIs, and unfortunately, to my ego's disappointment, I found these three. Rain World, of course. I think Rain World has a very complex AI. The creatures not only interact with you, they fight each other too, and they can even switch from enemies to allies depending on how you interact with them. This game is a masterpiece in so many aspects, but the walkers can't handle jumps. Ha! The Outfoxies, an arcade game where you had to pay to play. In it, a single enemy has AI capable of finding weapons, using them, navigating a map made of smooth platforms and ramps with various inclinations, climbing and jumping to reach other platforms. The game was released in 1994 and runs on an 8-bit CPU, which makes it admirable. 
Super Fighters 2, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game similar to the Outfoxies, where you can play against the CPU. However, I've only found matches where two humans compete, so I'm not clear on the CPU's abilities. But based on the level design, it seems to behave similarly to the Outfoxies. Now, how does Moons of Darcelon manage the Walker AI? When developing Moons of Darcelon, I aimed for an artificial intelligence that was at least worthy of being called such, especially because I needed to make sure the Darcenauts, the friendly NPCs, could follow you, because there is a huge difference between the AI of a friendly NPC and that of an enemy. An enemy can have a cyclical or dumb behavior, which, as we've seen in Hollow Knight, is something that, surprisingly, is accepted. Nobody complains if the enemies are stupid, and most of the time, they are. I'm not talking about difficulty. I'm talking about intelligence. But a friendly NPC can't afford to be that stupid. That's why I researched the available pathfinding options, like the ASAW algorithm and nav meshes. But these are geared towards 3D or top-down 2D games. They aren't suited for platformers because they can't handle jumps. Well, I did find some AI assets for platformers in the Unity store, but they were all based on terrain tiles. The character understands the terrain because the number of terrain block types is limited, and it makes decisions based on things like, if this wall is one tile high, I can jump over it. If it's two or more, I can't. If the distance to jump is one tile, it can reach the other side. If it's more, it can't. This wasn't useful for Moons of Darcelon since the terrain is organic, made of totally irregular polygons and dynamic. It can be created and destroyed in real time. On top of that, the characters must be able to jump to and from flying platforms that move in all directions, and depending on the position and speed of the platform at any given moment, decide whether to jump or wait for a better opportunity. And they also need to manage jumping onto vehicle loading areas. How can you make those decisions if you're only basing them on tiles? You can't. Many streamers, while playing, called the poor Darsonaut stupid because they expected them to be able to solve all the problems or because they didn't do exactly what the streamer had in mind. The truth is, they are indeed stupid if we look at them from a human perspective. But compared to other NPCs found in platformer games, even though they may be a bit chaotic at times, they're 1,000 times smarter than that of the vast majority of platformers they may have played. But I really understand why they might not notice this, because there isn't a direct comparison. After all, what other games have NPC companions that follow you while navigating platform terrain? None? At least, I don't know of any. And just to clarify, flying companions don't count. A flying AI has nothing to do with platforming. So. How do characters navigate the terrain in Moons of Darcelon? First, they have vision, which allows them to detect points of interest. This is implemented through a circle collider in trigger mode, with its center slightly offset from the character. The vision script will identify and prioritize all visible objects of interest and will define our target, which will then determine our behavior. All objects that enter the vision collider are identified by the vision script, and if there's a direct line of sight between the object and the character, it's considered a visible object. All visible objects are then prioritized, and this object is communicated to another script, Target AI, to determine what the NPC's behavior will be. For example, if it's a Darson out and it sees its commander, the player character, its objective will be to approach the commander. But if, while doing so, it spots an enemy, which is a higher priority object, it will ignore the commander and its behavior will shift to fleeing from the enemy. Instead, for enemy AI, if they see a target, like the commander, they'll attempt to approach while shooting. In addition to the commander and enemies, there are other types of visible objects, such as friendly characters, energy pickups, the base at the end of the level, and other internal objects, like markers of the last seen position of something. These markers, for convenience, act like visible objects, but they are only visible to NPCs, not to the player. This explains vision in terms of identifying points of interest and defining NPC behavior. But how do they navigate the terrain? This is handled by the most complex of the three scripts, called Walker AI. Oh, by the way, this flowchart you see here is a simplified version of how it actually works inside. I made it during a pretty early stage of development, and now it's way more complex. It's also important to note that many of these nodes are just simple if-then statements. But others, like stop, look for place to jump, or look for place to jump on the go, are very complex processes. They would require separate diagrams like this one, and probably one or two videos, 
just to fully understand how they work in detail. And I'm really sorry to stop here just when things were getting interesting, but editing the next part to make it understandable is taking me forever, and my brand new and unjustified oversized video editor ego won't allow me to do a sloppy job. So, I'm afraid you'll have to wait for episode 11 to see how these little irreverent troublemakers manage to find their way. You know what to do if you don't want to miss it.